quitting your 9 to 5 to hit the slopes is a fantasy many only dream of. For Tanya Hester and her husband Mark Bungie, a dream is a reality. Hester was just 38 years old when she retired. Do you think you'll go back into the workforce at some point? I hope to never have a traditional job again. I don't want to have to go in and be there at 9 o'clock and leave at 6 or 7 or 8 or 9 or whatever it is. They're both part of a trend. People leaving behind the traditional workforce for something different. And some are following their lead. And it's picking up steam among millennials, garnering headlines. They're choosing very different paths than previous generations who prioritized buying homes and starting families. So I think for many, early retirement or saving toward financial independence is sort of just a way of saying like, okay, well, no one else is going to help me be secure or safe in my older years, and so I have to do that for myself. Hester and her husband are completely financially independent. We earned good incomes. I was really just letting time do the work. How much time? From the time that we decided to retire early until we actually did it was about six years. We definitely saved very quickly and aggressively in that time. <laughs> With very strict budgeting, including wearing parkas inside during winter to keep the heating bills down, Hester and her husband were able to quit stressful political consulting jobs two years ago with very healthy retirement accounts in place. We were able to kind of constrain our lifestyle and not inflate it year over year as a lot of people do as you earn more and really focus on earning more, banking our raises. Hester and her husband are part of a movement called FIRE, financial independence to retire early. Most people who follow FIRE aim to save half of their take-home income after tax and spend less, picking and choosing exactly where their money goes. But it doesn't take complete financial independence to make the jump into an alternative lifestyle. Just ask Sarah Solomon. Right now I am outside of my camper van, just cruising around New Zealand and exploring. And then I have this great little table where I set up my laptop and do work in the morning. <laughs> or Nathan Krasinski. Running with the dogs, it's a kind of euphoric feeling. It feels like you're just riding a, a magic carpet. He deferred a future in chemical engineering for life on the Alaskan frontier mushing dogs. I went to school for six years. A lot of time spent sitting down in the library. It's kind of ready for something different, uh, change of pace, and take a little detour. What you doing there? But Solomon doesn't know when or if she's ever coming back. When I left New York City, I said, oh, I'll go for a year. I'll travel for a year, and then I'll come back and, you know, probably get a job again. It's obviously been longer than a year with, you know, no end in sight. She left an enviable job at a big publicity firm. I started getting a little tired of just the same nine to five routine every day, getting up, going to work and just repeating it. Um, and I was a little unhappy at my, you know, at one of my jobs. So I started looking for other opportunities. And now works as a freelance publicist from anywhere around the world, be it Guatemala, or Hawaii. One of the things I've found amongst millennials is that they have an idealized image of what their life should look like. And they don't want to settle for less. They really are a very self-aware generation that has been raised to ask the question why. Why should I be working at this job that I don't like? Robbie Ludwig is a psychotherapist in New York. When patients come to me, I ask them, is it smart and wise to leave a job before you have something else or a plan in place? Can they afford to make that switch? We're living at a time when the safety nets are disappearing, when corporations are promising less and less to employees. You know, very few jobs have pensions anymore or have any kind of like paid retirement. Young people who have graduated into recession or who have, have come into this country where they have record student loan debt and they're getting paid less proportionately than their parents did and being promised less. It should be no surprise to anyone that so many are saying, well, I need to take things into my own hands. For those looking to take control of their lives and finances, the FIRE movement is an attractive thought. But some, like Susie Orman, say it's unrealistic. Just don't be unrealistic. Naysayers warn that without padding that 401k over time, workers could be in big trouble later in life. We're all equal. So Hester admits that not everyone can achieve financial independence, but for her, the free time allows the flexibility to do more fulfilling work. This year I wrote a book, I write my blog, I, I do a podcast. All of those things look like work, uh, but they're things that are passion projects for me. It doesn't feel like work. This is called um, creative listening. She now works to share her knowledge with a group often excluded from financial conversations, 
women. Women have been, since the beginning of time, excluded from the high finance kind of conversation. So if you're going to talk about investing, or you're going to talk about retirement planning, that's a conversation for the men. And if you were a woman on your own, you would have to hire a male financial advisor. She started hosting female-focused financial literacy workshops. What are the specific challenges out there, the hurdles that women need to overcome in order to, you know, two feet firmly in this movement? I think we have to be very realistic about the wage gap. We know that women on average earn about 70% of what men earn. We know that women make up by far the bulk of minimum wage earners in most states. So women are coming at this a little bit lower down the hill uh, in many cases. I think women can do everything financially that men can do, but it does take us kind of getting, getting over all the socialization we've received that tells us that, no, this isn't for us, this is for them. No, this is for us too. For women at the workshop, like Cara Perez, it's an opportunity to learn. How does it feel when you look around the conference and see all these women? What are you uh, hearing from them? So many women are ecstatic to be here and they feel a sense of community and support, which is great because it can feel very isolating at times. Financial literacy isn't something we teach in schools. It's not something many parents feel comfortable talking about or even have themselves. So don't blame anyone, including myself, for not having the perfect financial know-how at 18 years old. Hester believes financial independence shouldn't be exclusive to the uber wealthy or highly educated. Instead, she recommends these tips for getting started. Be mindful of your expenses and cut out extra spending that doesn't bring you happiness. Focus on increasing your take-home pay every year. And when you do get pay raises, don't spend the new money you're earning. Instead, put it into retirement accounts. I feel like one of the luckiest people who's ever lived. I think the real power here was just in creating a place for people to come together and less about what I might happen to know. It's more just saying, okay, let's all get together and do this. And I don't think that's gonna stop. I think for me, it's, it's not about, it's not that I wanna sit at home and sip umbrella drinks. It's that I wanna be able to help make the world better and make this ac accessible to as many people as possible. She wants everyone to have the freedom to choose to do something they love. For Nightline, I'm Gloria Riviera in Colorado. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.